preparing to live stream the meeting. There's some media preparing to whatever. I don't know. Well, in Princess Brian, he says, My name is Amaya Montorio. <laughs> that, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Mandy Patinkin. Yes. I, he went to KU and I saw him. <laughs> So, good afternoon and welcome in to Wednesday at 1. I'm Pastor Susan and we are working through um the second Kings, and we are beginning in the third chapter. So if you're in the study Bible, we're on page 595. Um, or if you're not, then you're just still going to have to find your way to second Kings <laughs> chapter three. I think you can probably. Probably do that. Um, and I am nervous about what was going on at the church, like the building was burning down or something, but it just sometimes the pastor's plate gets filled with emergency things that people are calling in and trying to work through. And, you know, you just kind of got to say something's got to give. And it was you guys. So I, I apologize, but there are people who got help working through some issues that are very happy that I was with them. So <laughs> it wasn't about me, <laughs> you know, but anyway, so thank you for, for seeding time to, uh, Uh, child of God, and at some point will show up on Zoom, or you may be watching on YouTube or Facebook. So welcome in, and um, and I'm glad that you are here with us today. So um, let's begin uh, before we start the prayer for the reading. While I'm waiting uh, for some folks to come in on Zoom, um, I wanted to take our our prime research assistant <laughs> Pam. <laughs> Last time we met. We finished the reading with the story about that was a little, you know, I mean, bullying is not good for in any case, but still really. So Pam, I, I said, but that would be a good Google question to find out. So Pam came up with a number of things, but let me just boil this down to three points. And primarily, um, this is one of those things where you kind of, when you say, do I really need to know the original languages? You don't. Okay. I'll take, let you off the hook for that. But, um, it is helpful, and this is one of the reasons why you will you will find um, that sometimes the words that are translated are not exactly the best translation into English, and there are a number of reasons for that, which I won't go into. But oftentimes, you'll note when I preach, I say a better translation of that is because there's not it's not a set thing that there's only one word, you know, it's like in English, it's car. <laughs> and in Hebrew, it's this word, you know, that there's a lot of innuendo and shades of meaning. So the part of the problem is this comes out of the King James Version translation. And the translation of the word for children is really not accurate. It means young men. Okay, so instead of thinking children, like elementary school people, think about really raucous and rowdy high school kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or maybe this summer between high school and college, you know, frat boys, okay, I think is a great way. I wouldn't translate it like that, but that gives you the kind of contemporary image. So you got more than 42 because 42 of them were killed. So you know that there was, there were more than 42 of them. So you got a mob of 50 frat guys who are basically you know, bullying Elisha the prophet and calling him names and calling out the fact that he's bald and 
now here again, the translation of bald is, is right, but this is one of those where you got to have a little background because he could have just been hairless, <laughs> you know, um, or he could have shaved his head because he was a prophet. <laughs> okay. So the fact that he, um, you know, that his head was bald was a symbol of, of being a prophet. And so basically what they were doing was making fun of him. And so let me just read this little little line from the commentary. In summary, 2 Kings 2, 23 to 24 is not an account of God mauling young children for making fun of a bald man. Rather, it is a record of an insulting demonstration against God's prophet by a large group of young men. Because these young people of about 20 years of age or older, the same term is used of Solomon in 1 Kings 3, 7. So despised the prophet of the Lord, Elisha called upon the Lord to deal with the rebels as he saw fit. The Lord's punishment was the mauling of 42 of them by two female bears. I like, <laughs> it's kind of a little irony there that they were female bears. The penalty was clearly justified for to ridicule Elisha was to ridicule the Lord himself. The seriousness of the crime was indicated by the seriousness of the punishment. The appalling judgment was God's warning to all who would scorn the prophets of the Lord. So makes it a little bit more palatable, not totally, but still a little more understandable <laughs> than God sent a couple of bears to eat a bunch of little kids. You know, <laughs> it's like, no, I don't think that's exactly what's going on here. So, okay. Lloyd and Melvo have joined us. You froze. And of the full second generation. Oh. And we thank you for allowing us to hear his story and to um, and to be able to put ourselves in these situations and wonder maybe perhaps what we would do had we been called in the same way as Alicia had been. So we thank you for this witness. We thank you for the testimony of scripture as a whole. Thank you for the opportunity to walk alongside the people from so many years ago. And we have your light in our heart and in our heads and uh, open our minds to see things maybe in a different way this day. We pray all these things in the name of the living word, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to pick it up at um, chapter three. If you will recall now that uh, Elisha, Elijah had chosen El Elisha, and you can call him Elisha or Elisha, however you learned it, and you know, it's kind of not a big deal. Um and so this is where we're going to talk now about the setting in which Elisha is going to do his ministry. In the 18th year of King Jehoshaphat of Judah, Jehoram, son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria. He reigned for 12 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and mother, for he removed the pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sin of Jeroboam, son of Nephat, because he caused Israel to commit, which he caused Israel to commit. He did not depart from it. So we've got that just that little bit. You've got Jer Jehoram is reigning over Israel, which is the northern kingdom, okay, north of Jerusalem in that northern area called Israel. And then um, King Jehoshaphat is still reigning in the southern kingdom, which is headquartered in Jerusalem. So now you've got these two kings in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, because this is now the time after David. So the kingdoms have split into north and south and no longer are united as they were under David and Solomon. So moving on at verse four. Now, King Misha of Moab was a sheep breeder who used to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram, the guy from the south, marched out of Samaria at that time and <laughs> mustered all of Israel. I'm sorry, the king of the north. All he went, 
As he went, he sent word to King Jehoshaphat of Judah. That's the guy from the south. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to battle against Moab? And he answered, I will. I am with you. My people are your people. My horses are your horses. Then he asked, by which way shall we march? Jehoram answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom set out, and when they had made a roundabout march of seven days, there was no water for the army or for the animals that were with them. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has summoned us, three kings, only to be handed over to Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here, through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Then one of the servants of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah, is here. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Elisha others. But the king of Israel said to him, no, it is the Lord who has summoned us, three kings, only to be handed over to Moab. Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives, whom I serve, were it not that I have regard for King Jehoshaphat of Judah, I would give you neither a look nor a glance, but get me a musician. It's like, <laughs> haven't we all said that yeah. but get me a musician <laughs> and then while the musician was playing the power of the lord came on him and he said thus says the lord i will make this wadi full of pools for thus says the lord you shall see neither wind nor rain but the wadi shall be filled with water so that you shall drink you your cattle and your animals this is only a trifle in the sight of the Lord, for he will also hand Moab over to you. You shall conquer every fortified city and every choice city, every good tree you shall fell, all springs of water you shall stop up, and every good piece of land you shall ruin with stones. The next day, about the time of the morning offering, suddenly water began to flow from the direction of Edom until the country was filled with water. When all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to put on armor from the youngest to the oldest were called up and were drawn up. The Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. They said, this is blood. The kings must have fought together and killed one another. Now then, Moab to the spoil. But when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and attacked the Moabites who fled before them. As they entered Moab, they continued the attack. The cities they overturned and on every good piece of land, everyone threw a stone until it was covered. Every spring of water they stopped up and every good tree they felled. Only at Kir Hariseth did the stone walls remain until the slingers surrounded and attacked it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his firstborn son who was to succeed him and offered him as a burnt offering on the wall. And a great wrath came upon Israel. So they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. So, wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just when you thought it was safe to go back into the forest, yeah. <laughs> here comes the Moabites. Well, wasn't Ruth a Moabite? Mm -hmm. or a Mo mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I, when I heard, um, I am with you, my people are your people, my horses are your yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> and that must be the the what did they call that um something that the moabites say yeah yeah you know say <laughs> that's like the the trivia game 
things the Amobites would say, you know, password or but whatever I, that, that, that game is. It just automatically is. drew me to yeah. Ruth for some reason. That No, uh -huh. that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the other thing, a couple of things I just wanted to pull out of this that, you know, as we, mm -hmm. as we read through a, a lot now, what we're going to see now in Second Kings really throughout the rest of the book is these skirmishes and little wars and, and stuff like that, where they continue either to forget about calling on God or calling on God. And Hmm. When they call on God, they are victorious, you know, and or when they seek God's providence, you know, um, it goes well with them. And when they forget, it doesn't go so so too great, you know. <laughs> so um, so there's a couple of things going on in this particular little story. And um, and and basically, it's kind of funny to me because um, the reason this started was the guy who used to give gifts of sheep and wool to the king, um, you know, all of a sudden that stopped. And so the king who was receiving that little gift or that big gift was like, hmm, this is not good. Um, you know, so it's it's a it's like a trade war. <laughs> okay. You know, the, the agreement that we had before has now stopped and now we're going to fight over it. OK, so number one, as as things have gone, things always seem to go. But I wanted to call your attention to, you know, these three kings that we've got that are gathered together from the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom and Edom, which was the, the narrow land in between the, the two kingdoms and Moab um, are have have made an alliance against Moab. And as they're as they're going along, things start to get hard because they can't find water. And it's obvious that they, you know, that they're in trouble. And so the first thing they do is ask, instead of thinking that they can go directly to God, they ask if there's a prophet, anybody, anybody, prophet, anybody got a prophet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, anybody hear a prophet? You know, is there a doctor in the house kind of thing? But I thought it was really interesting because prior to this, people have been going to God directly you know, mm -hmm. that the prophet has taken the role more of listening to God and then talking to the, the hierarchy, whether it be the king or the, you know, whoever the principals are in the land. But the prophets, what we've seen of prophets up to this point is as the mediator from God to the people. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, now we have a new role here for prophets with Elisha, because Elijah was most definitely, he's listening to God and he's telling the kings and the kings are either listening to him or not, you know. So here we have now this new job description that comes about with Elisha, where not only is he going to be listening from God to the people or taking stuff from God to the people, but it sounds like it's turning a little bit more so that now the prophet becomes the interlocutor for, you know, the people to God. Uh, and so there's kind of a new dimension of this. And, it, you know, the scripture doesn't make that much of it, except for this is sort of a turning point here as we move from Elijah, the, the old school prophet, mm -hmm. to Elisha, the new school prophet, because Elisha is adding now um, to his resume diplomat. <laughs> 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 um, the other thing is, if you're not familiar with the word wadi, um, a wadi is, is like creek bed. Uh, you know, kind of, you know, depressions in the land where water would catch and gather if if you had it, it not necessarily a spring, but just depressions in the land where water would gather. We, we, we might call it a pond or, a, you know, something like that on, you know, like a on a farm, you you'd dig out a pond to catch rainwater, that kind of thing. So the wadis, uh, oftentimes the nomads would stop and they knew where the large wadis were so that they could go from wadi to wadi and know they were going towards water. But obviously, you know, even the wadis were dried up. So basically, I think in in literature and in lore, we talk about a wadi um, in terms of like an oasis, because with a wadi, if it's usually filled with water, then there's vegetation around it. You know, so um, but oftentimes now when <laughs> if you see something about archaeological digs, a lot of those places were commonly known and so they became a location of their own so like you know we this was a an archaeological site at wadi badada you know <laughs> um i can't think of one off the top of my head but there are a bunch of them and a lot of a lot of the wadis were great places for um 
archaeological finds because there was so much because there was so much trash left at the <laughs> wadi. You know, if they camped overnight and they're on a journey and they they have their water and everything and they just left their trash, maybe they buried it, you know, or maybe the sand took it or whatever. But, you know, so there was a, a repository of where people had been. Um, and so that's why archaeologically they, they are treasure troves because you see what people carried with them, what was transitory, you know, what was the... Um, the convenience stuff of the time that they would carry with them to a certain point and then they would dispose of it. So th this is kind of the contemporary where we put all of the plastic water bottles. <laughs> they, did not recycle. <laughs> they did not recycle. Well, they recycled better because it went into the, into the ground, you know, but um, anyway, so that's kind of a, a interesting little point there. I thought anyway, um, I'm, I'm wondering with regard to the musician, I yeah. wonder if that, I, I, and I don't know, I wonder if down the road that he uses music as a, like a yoga or a, like a yoga thing or a, um, where he has to sit, listen mm -hmm. to music, and then all of a sudden he got, yeah. So yeah. I'm wondering if that's part of his repertoire as well. Uh, I have a little note. For okay. Of harpists to create a disposition conducive to receiving the word of the Lord. Okay. So this one says a harpist. Okay. I, yeah. I Can we have a, yeah. well, mine, says, mine's a little in general. Bring me a harpist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there again, how, you know, what's the Hebrew word and is it harpist or is it musician you yeah. know so but I think I have always looked at this and I don't know why I have no nothing to support this idea but I think Alicia this is he's starting to starting to identify his brand you know <laughs> and it's kind of like okay you know they're used to Elijah who calls fire down on uh, you know and all this kind of stuff and I, that's not who I am. I'm going to do things a little differently. So they got to get used to me and how I do stuff. So this is, could be, this is kind of corny, but this could be like performance art <laughs> You know, that Alicia is going to say, this is how I work. You know, this is how, it, this is what a prophet looks like now. So get rid of the old idea and welcome to the new world, you know? <laughs> so this is, this is the way we do it. So just to, I think, to set him apart from the way Elijah had done stuff because, and I think this truly is a transitionary passage that see, that we get to see how that transition was made from prophet to prophet. And I, as far as I know, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I'm sure there are others, but this is one of the few places where we see a prophet, you know, kind of preparing and, and getting his successor ready sending him out and then watching the successor kind of get their sea legs in the, in the prophecy game, you know? So, cause I can't think of another, if, can you, can anybody think of another prophet where you have one prophet and then you see who comes after them to be the next prophet? I, I can't, well, but we, can like get. you say, we do have prophets, but you know, like Daniel, is yeah. Daniel a prophet? I don't, well yeah but guys. i don't yeah Ezekiel, yeah Daniel, yeah but you know i don't know that we have <laughs> i mean we got like moses who i guess you could call a prophet but you know he kind of passed on his mantle to caleb and joshua um but i, I you wouldn't consider joshua a prophet so it's like you know that was definitely the passing down of authority and blessing but and that sort Moses of thing is actually a prophet I thought no I mean he was like just the leader yeah the... yeah I don't know that he was not I wouldn't consider him a prophet in the Old Testament prophet mold you know but um anyway so so that's sometimes these stories of war have all kinds of other things going on <laughs> okay so I'm going to go ahead unless you got anything else about that um this is a kind of we got a couple of stories here that are, thank goodness, something from the Old Testament that's familiar. <laughs> it's like, oh, I know this story. Um, so this is uh, Elisha and the widow. Now, the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? tell me, what do you have in the house? She answered, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. 
He said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your children and start pouring into all these vessels. When each is full, set it aside. So she left him and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her and she kept pouring. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, there are no more. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your children can live on the rest. One day, Elisha was passing through Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to have a meal. So whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for a meal. She said to her husband, look, I am sure that this man who regularly passes our way is a holy man of God. Let us make a small roof chamber with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when he came there, he went up to the chamber and lay down there. He said to his servant, Gehazi, call the Shunammite woman. When he called her, she stood before him. He said to him, he said to him, say, when he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, say to her, since you have taken all this trouble for us, what may be done for you? I'm sorry, I was confused myself there. Was I <laughs> Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I live among my own people. He said, what then men may be done for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. When he had called her, she stood at the door and he said, at this season in due time, you shall embrace a son. She replied, no, my Lord, oh man of God, do not deceive your servant. The woman conceived and bore a son at that season in due time as Elisha had declared to her. When the child was older, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. He complained to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. He carried him and brought him to his mother. The child sat on her lap until noon and he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, closed the door on him and left. Then she called to her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys so that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. He said, why go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, it will be all right. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, urge the animal on. Do not hold back for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there's the Shumamite woman. Run at once to meet her and say to her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is the child all right? She answered, it is all right. When she came to the man of God at the mountain, she caught hold of his feet. Gehazi approached to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for she is in bitter distress. The Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not mislead me? He said to Gehazi, gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, give no greeting. And if anyone greets you, do not answer and lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave without you. So he rose up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. He came back to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and closed the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got up on the bed and lay upon the child, putting his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And while he lay bent over him, the flesh of the child became warm. He got down, walked once to and fro in the room, then got up again and bent over him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. 
Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, take your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. And she took her son and left. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the company of the prophets was sitting before him, he said to his servant, put the large pot on and make some stew for the company of prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs. He found a wild vine and gathered from it a lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. They served some for the men to eat. But while they were eating the stew, they cried out, Oh, man of God, there is death in the pot. They could not eat it. He said, then bring some flour. He threw it into the pot and said, serve the people and let them eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He said, it before them, they ate. <laughs> so many of these things happen again ah know, the echoes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you're, you're reading it and you're going well that happened well, that but, happened yeah, yeah that like, happened <laughs> yeah so you know this is the part where i say you know people talk about how consistent scripture is and you're like what do you mean how does that mean you know mm -hmm. well what it means is when jesus was doing a lot of what he was doing he knew these stories i mean this is like i mean i don't think he sat up at night <laughs> You know, kind of going, ooh, which one can I do tomorrow? You know, that'd be good. Oh, here was a favorite one. I'll do this again, you know. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think this is part of the thing. His witness was to the people of Israel. And they knew these stories, you know. So to have somebody who was coming and doing, you know, it's like, it's like if some, for lack of a better word, let's say, you know, there's a Barack Obama becomes president. OK, and then all of a sudden and I, we saw some of this on a, on a low level, but and all of a sudden people start making connections between him and Martin Luther King Jr., you know, or other, you know, famous African-Americans. Um, and then and then people started, you know, almost anything that he spoke about, you would hear echoes of King's sermons, mm -hmm. you know, because in the African-American experience, that is such a powerful you know, King was such a powerful figure. I mean, not just in the African American community, but especially there. Um, they knew those those sermons. They knew that cadence. They knew those words. Um, and you know, so just interesting how people bring the. In fact, it's kind of a weirdo example. But I, as I was driving in this morning, I was listening to CNN and. Um, uh, I'll get it. Just a minute. Congresswoman Cheney, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically they just assume she's getting ready to now, uh, uh, she'll think about running for president because mm -hmm. she lost her race, right? But she named her PAC, her super PAC, the great task. Mm -hmm. And the great task is a phrase from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and Lincoln <laughs> was kind of the founding poobah of the Republican Party as we know it today. So, you know, here's, a, this is a great example of this, you know, yeah. she's claiming just by this, and there will be people who will, will never get that. They'll just right. go, okay, we got a lot to, got a lot to work on, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, she knows exactly what she's doing. Her speech writers know exactly what she's doing so that her super PAC now is, you know, now I am not about being a Congresswoman from Wyoming. Now I am about you know, the great task. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And whatever it is to save democracy or however she envisions it. But I thought, wow, you know, somebody's been working on that for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so we got to find, you know, you got to find the image, you got to find something that will resonate with people in the constituency that she's trying to reach. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that was really smart. 
you know? So, so I, you can imagine that Jesus did the same thing, you know, and that God would say, okay, remember <laughs> yeah. the story I used to tell you about Elijah? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you know, and there's also, there's in the Shunammite woman's story, it echoes Abraham and Sarah, mm -hmm. and then it comes down to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like all oh yeah combined oh, yeah. in there. Well, you know, if you start at, at at chapter four, okay. So first we have this thing about a, a jar of oil that doesn't run out, okay. <laughs> yeah. So here's a couple. There's a number of echoes that go there. The, the mm -hmm. Elijah and the widow who didn't have you know, anything right. to eat. And she and her son were going to die or she had a little bit. She was going to make a cake and they were going to eat it and die. You know? Mm -hmm. So this is his predecessor. Now he's replicating part of that miracle, but he's doing it with the oil jug. Cause I think Elijah went back to that widow and eventually at one point said, you know, the, the oil will not run out. The flour will not run out. You'll have enough to eat, you know? So he's, he's got the oil. Also, this is a ritual thing. You know, we got oil for not only for eating and food, but it's a ritual. So he's, he's brought in the ritual of music. He's mm -hmm. brought in the ritual of oil, you know? So as we watch him develop his, as I can, for lack of a better word, develop his brand, you know, he's starting to use these other things. And for the, the people, the Hebrew people, you know, well past the, the canonization of scripture, um, with it's just remarkable, you know, because it has that kind of stuff. Then we've got the again the the Shunammite boy and. <laughs> You know, there, some of these women, especially the women who had, con, you know, conversation in context with prophets, mm -hmm. you know, the, the widow that Elijah ran into is basically like, sure, I'll make you a cake. I was going to feed my son and we were going to die, but sure, I'll give it to you, <laughs> you know, you know, kind of in his face. Like I got nothing to lose here. Well, Sarah, yeah, she laughed. exactly. Yeah. She left. And this gal, this Shunammite woman, don't you know, at you. first she's like, now don't, don't mess with me. Right. You know, don't be telling me you're giving me a son. You know, you got to know that this is a big deal for me. And then when the kid dies, she's like, you said, I mean, yeah. I told you, don't mess with me, you know, and, you know, like the widow and the judge, and she wore him out with her persistence, you know, it was like, I'm, I'm going toe to toe with this guy, because so you can't unusual. do me like that, you know, it was so unusual to see a woman get on a donkey, I mean, to yeah, about and right. To go and confront this man who came. Who yeah, and I'm not leaving without you. Exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. go. You go ahead, I'm send your leaving. servant with your staff. I don't care. You are I'm coming with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like I love these. I love these women. And it's funny. I it it struck me as I was reading it. I don't think there's any other place where they say hey, they saddled up a donkey. No. Okay. You know, it's like yeah. Uh, apparently they settled up donkeys. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I knew they r rode donkeys, but right. I, you know, usually they just have a blanket over it. It seems like I don't remember ever yeah, seeing a wonder. saddle. I mean, that's my yeah. from my horse days. You know, it's like okay, I wonder what kind of saddle they put, put a donkey saddle on. I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway, and then this very odd thing where he lie, you know, he lies down on top of him and basically they does CPR, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, right. little mouth to mouth okay, going on here. CPR, the first CPR was done. There you go. I actually think that's from the creation. Okay. There you go. There's another one. I'm thinking that's God and, and Adam mm -hmm. in that regard. Yeah. Because then he sure. gets up and he walked to and fro and the kids sneeze seven times. Duh! Seven days, yep. seven times. <laughs> See, you guys are getting it now. You guys are getting it. That, that was that whole thing was just so full, mm -hmm. chock full of good stuff. Yeah, so, oh, really. Yeah, I, so much in one chat in one yeah, chapter. Story, yeah. It was yeah. like, okay, mm -hmm. we just go from one thing to another and it just keeps building until you're like, wow, what can See, anything else happen? I've been telling you this for years. <laughs> you know, the layers, you just get the layers and it just, it doesn't change the story, except no. it just makes it so deep and, and, you know, it's got so many 
I mean, you're just, the way you yeah, think about right, it. Yeah, right. you know, it's like you either know somebody or you know somebody, right. you know? Right. <laughs> so, okay, so then we got another one here coming up, the healing of Naaman. And honestly, I'm going to, I'm going to, just read the name and story. Well, uh, yeah, well, I'll just, we'll do five. <laughs> Unless you got anything else. Any other echoes we missed? <laughs> well, well, the, the pot is the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah. 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 You know, the pot of was, was similar to like the feeding of the 5,000, not the 5,000, yeah. but you know, just the eternal. Yeah. Well, and the, that too, the purification. the purification. Yeah. Is, yeah. and I'm thinking, Oh, I didn't know you could put flour into stew right. and get poison out. You know, I mean, yeah. you could put potatoes in if you got too much salt, but I didn't, yeah. you know. <laughs> then, you get, then you get gravy. There you get gravy. So, yeah, I don't, I, you know, something is lost to me in the purification of the pot of stew. But yeah, that here again, a, that could, have, like, could have been a liturgical thing. It's like, you know, he's, he's receiving yeah. the stew and even the bad stuff, you know, gets made right. I'll report back next week. Would you please? <laughs> Would you please? I mean, all these little piddly things. Okay, I love how many it. Time do they saddle up a donkey? Yeah. Prophets and their minions. There yeah. you go. There you go. Okay. So, chapter five. Naaman, commander of the army and of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mist mistress, if only my Lord were with, were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. <laughs> okay, we got some gifts going here. Yeah. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the... When this, and just because just he got older doesn't mean it doesn't know when to interrupt me. <laughs> when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you my servant name and you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. <laughs> but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me, he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. And according to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. Company, he came and stood before. Him. Please accept a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will accept nothing. He urged him to accept, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let two mule loads of earth be given to your servant, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god except the Lord. But may the Lord pardon your servant on one count. When my master goes into the house of Reman to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow down in the house of Reman, 
When I do bow down in the house of Remen, may the Lord pardon your servant on this one account. He said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, Elisha, the man of God, thought, my master has, as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something out of him. So Gehazi went after Naaman. I don't get this part of the story. No. When Naaman saw someone running after him, he jumped down from the chariot to meet him and said, is everything all right? He replied, yes, but my master has sent me to say, two members of a company of prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Naaman said, please accept two talents. He urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and gave them to two of his servants who carried them in, fr in front of Gehazi. When he came to the citadel, he took the bags from them and stored them inside. He dismissed the men and they left. He went in and stood before his master and Elisha said to him, where have you been Gehazi? He answered, your servant has not at all, sheep and oxen and male and female slaves. Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he left his presence leprous, as white as snow. Mm. Mm. That's what she did. Mm. Don't lie. <laughs> um, I found it interesting when he said that he would not accept the gift. And that's what Mother Teresa, her order was that when they went into a house, they would not accept even a glass of water. Mm -hmm. And I think that she said that it was because she didn't want to show favoritism from from one person. They go to another house and not accept a gift. Oh, wow. So yeah. they weren't allowed to accept anything at all. Wow. Oh, that's houses. interesting. I never, yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, yeah. that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And I wonder if she got it from here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You could probably, yeah, probably. But I love this. Um, you know, th this story is usually the Old Testament reading. Um, it's connected to one of the gospel healings of the, le of a leper that Jesus heals a leper, but then this is the the back, you know, this is the old Testament story that's linked to it, but we don't get that second part yeah. about Gehazi. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah. you know, don't mess with the prophet, you know? Right. Well, well, you can also see here too, baptism, mm -hmm. John the Baptist, go to the, the Jordan. Yeah. Go to the Jordan seven times and only the Jordan and then wash and be clean, believe and be baptized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know yeah. how all that came. Well, let me just make a point on that. It's interesting. Um, the the two rivers that you know that they say are in Damascus, where he came comes right. from, but they were in Samaria, okay, which isn't that close to the Jordan. I mean, it's not. I mean, nothing is that far, really, that far away. But yeah. he, it's not like he could just go out in the back and jump into the river seven times. I mean, now he was going to have to travel to some place that he didn't know. You know, and why couldn't he just go home and do it? At, you know, it's, it makes a lot of sense. But I think you're right in that, you know, this is one of those uh, here again. Think about it in terms of liturgy and the liturgical practices that are being set up here mm -hmm. um, in connection with Elisha to give him a different kind of brand than Elijah had. You know, that he's he's going to this is all precursor to temple worship. This is all precursor to the stuff that, you know, for the same way. You know, we've talked about in the beginning of Genesis that the seven days of creation were highly influenced. That account, that strand of the Pentateuch is highly influenced by the priestly account. You know, so the priests, it the priests needed it to be a one, two, three, four, five, six. And on the seventh day, God rested mm -hmm. because the priests, if there was no Sabbath, there was no priest, you know, they, you know, why, yeah. why do we bother here? You know, it's like, so let's set this story up in such a way that even God rests. So we should all rest, you know, <laughs> and when you're resting, you need to praise God and you're going to need people to help you do that. You know, I mean, that's, they didn't do that, but you know, it's like, as you look back now, 
and you can see as you look forward now you've got you know you're setting up kind of an echo for Hanukkah you're you're setting up the echoes for music and worship and oil and you know healing um cleansing through the baptismal you know they weren't like baptizing like in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, yeah. but cleansing, you know, there were pools, the pool of Siloam was a pool for purification before you went into the temple. So all these kinds of things that are going to have, that had meaning for the people who heard the stories for generations, they knew yeah. what they were talking about. They, they would make those connections. You know, so and who forgive your servant for going to the house of Rima. Is that like a God that he's going? Into? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. But this guy is, it's asking to be him to be forgiven or for someone else who goes into that house to be forgiven. I understand I that as he's asking for him, he's going to, he's going to go in to his own worship place because he's, the you know he's the sergeant of the guard or i mean he's oh, he, he serves yeah, the he, king yeah, he you know to. so he would have to do that but he wants him he wants alicia to understand he's doing that but now he knows that okay. that yahweh is the god of israel and who's that he he's seen the light but he's still gonna have to give lip <laughs> yeah. service to the other guy yeah, in the, the house go in peace i don't recall seeing that in the old testament hardly at all mm -mm. I know Paul says that like every other word, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. peace to you or, yeah. you know, whatever. Well, and he's saying it in response to this confession. Right. Exactly. You know? mm -hmm. So, I mean, holy smokes. So I would, I would guess, I do not know for sure, but I would guess that this is still, you know, part of that tradition of the priestly account that there, you know, that a lot of these things are appearing here, you know, so that you, you get that sense. And then, you know, later on, you look back and you go, oh, look at this. I mean, this stuff has been going on forever, all the way back to creation, all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Moses, you know. Um, so anyway. OK, so I hope you are OK with what I am about to tell you. <laughs> I am going to end the, our our foray into this into second kings um because as you know my time is limited with you um and i was thinking the rest of the rest of kings is it's like it's like Murder, death. battles and kings yeah. dying and you know all this kind of stuff and there i i will skim through it and if there's anything else that i feel like we need to jump to you know chapter 18 and pick up this you know well i'll do a final if you know if there's anything in here that i think would we would enjoy um, but here's my plan and you can, you can refute my plan if you like, but I think you'll like it. I haven't done this for, for a long time. And I, I, this would be fitting. I would like to take some of Paul's major themes and skip through his letters. Um, oh, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. just kind of lift up some of the, some of the stuff simply because Paul, um, you know, Paul kind of got rediscovered by the monks who were the Augustinian monks, um, you know, back in first, second century. Um, and, and as the monasteries got together and, and that kind of thing. So Paul's letters had, didn't have the, you know, the, you know, the big play of the gospels, you know, the gospels were the big deal. But Paul, you know, the letters were written before the gospels, you know, so you'd think by then, they would have had a lot of, you know, a lot of play in and around in the churches, but they kind of went, kind of fell by the wayside. You know, this is before they're canonizing scripture. So, so they're, they're, they're around, you know, some people had them, but people were focusing on the gospels. So the, these Augustinian monks sort of rediscovered Paul as the primary interpreter who literally influenced the gospels. Um, and so they, when you go back to Paul and think, okay, he's the first interpreter of Jesus and the Jesus event, and he's doing it in different communities. So he's a great preacher because he's preaching the same gospel in a variety of different communities to a variety of different audiences. And he has to kind of mold it for what's going on with them, you know, because basically they would send him a letter and say, we're going to heck in a handbasket because people are fighting over who gets to eat first, you know? <laughs> and so then he would take a, you know, go here and, yeah. Um, so a lot of what he interpreted, I, I mean, most of our atonement theories come from, directly from Paul. 
but then that flavors each of the gospel writers in a different way, different ones, but they were all, I mean, all of them came after Paul's letters, you know. So when the Augustinians rediscovered it, they their um, theological framework of the Augustinian order was Pauline. You know, it, it was highly, highly affected by Paul. Guess who was an Augustinian monk? Martin Luther. Martin Luther. <laughs> okay. So that's why Lutherans in general are so heavily influenced by Paul. Uh, lots of other places just kind of give him lip service, but we are, and you will, as I, as I pull out some of these things, you'll go, oh, I didn't know that was Paul. I thought that was Luther. Yeah, well, it was, but Luther got it from Paul. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, so I'd like to do that. And then we can go as deep as we want. I mean, I'll pull out of. book at a time you know but i'm not going to go through the book so you know we can you can kind of direct that as we have the conversations um if i can get a little bit ahead i'll tell you when we finish one day i'll say next week i want to this is the theme i'm going to do so if you want to read ahead and where wherever this comes from if that sounds okay to you i don't mm -hmm. hear i don't hear lloyd and melva jumping up and down so i guess we're okay <laughs> with that <laughs> you know, thumbs up okay <laughs> Okay, so that will be the plan. So next week, if there's anything left over in Second Kings that I think is, um, you know, elucidating, is that, a, is that the right word? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I will go ahead and pick that up, and uh, we'll go ahead and jump into. So next week is the twenty something. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Well, right. But anyway, so we'll basically by the end of uh, by the first of September, we'll be well into Paul you know so and then we can just keep doing that and if we finish it then there's always it'll just say okay now what are we going to do yeah. <laughs> no, no no we won't <laughs> no 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 that's right oh you i've taught you well i've taught you well okay thanks everybody i'll see you next time bye-bye hang on a second